Hello and welcome to the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries live event with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you are here to tune into Exploring the Depths of Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuary and Greater Fairlands National Marine Sanctuary, you are in the right place. We will begin promptly at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. Hi everybody and welcome to the live interaction with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants and NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. Today we are exploring the depths of Cordell Bank and Greater Fairlands National Marine Sanctuary with Jenny Stock. First, I'm going to turn it over to Joe Grabowski from Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants to give us a little bit more information on today's live event. Hi Joe. All right. Hey Hannah, thanks so much. Uh, for everybody joining us live today. Uh, really excited to have everyone joining us. So as mentioned, uh, my name is Joe Grabowski. I'll be hosting today's event with NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. Uh, I'm also the founder of a really cool educational organization called Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. So you should see I'm sharing my screen right now. I want to just take a quick minute to show you the website. So if you head over to exploringbytheseat.com, uh, uh, we host up to three to four live events every day with scientists, explorers, adventurers, and conservationists from all over the world that anybody can join uh, live and tune into. It's been a busy day already today. We have been doing dive expeditions with John Kendall of Global Underwater Exploration. We've been talking climate change with environment climate change scientists in Canada. We just had a World Otter Day event hanging out with Emma. Uh, in Costa Rica. We've still got sea turtle feeding today. Tomorrow we're going to the Duke Lemur Center. Uh, we are going out to some parks. We're learning about primates. There's always something exciting going on at exploringbytheseat.com and you can find a spot here to sign up for the newsletter. All right, moving along with a little housekeeping item for the presentations. We have a Slido room open today. So what that means in this Slido room, you can take part in some little poll questions uh, that we have. You can interact and we can see what the results are. So there's multiple ways to find it. You can go to Slido, so sli.do, and that will open up the room and then you just need to put in uh, the event code. So for today I put the event code as Cordell, pretty easy. There's a direct link that I have listed here. I'm also going to share it in the question section, uh, or sorry, the chat section of this call today. And I even put a QR code up today. If you have your cell phone handy, you can scan it. It'll open the room on your cell phone you can take part in some of those questions there but don't feel you have to sit there because when we tell you to jump in that's when you can jump into that room uh, and take part in the live stuff all right let me cancel this screen share here and come back to you there we go so we are about to take a virtual field trip into the depths of Cordell Bank and Greater Farallones uh, National Marine Sanctuary. We are going to hang out with Jenny Stock, but before we do, I'm going to throw things back to Hannah, Education Specialist with NOAA Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. Thank you, Joe, and thank you everybody for tuning in. I'm really excited about this expedition with Greater Fairlands and Cordell Bank, but first I want to tell you a little bit more about the National Marine Sanctuary System. We are a network of 14 national marine sanctuaries and two marine national monuments that encompass over 600,000 square miles of marine waters. We're going to go on a bit of a virtual tour of these sanctuaries, but first I want to go over the Slido tool. These live events are super interactive, so if you haven't already, log into Slido on a device or in another tab. Here is our first question, and in the chat is the link to the Slido too, so you can click on it right from there. So are you watching this live stream with anybody else? And if so, how many people? All right, so the results are starting to fill in here. There we go. There's the button I'm looking for. Okay, so we have a lot of people watching individually, and we have me and my cat. So. 
uh, <laughs> lots of social distancing going on at the moment. I love feline friends that join, that's great. All right, so the next question is, have you heard of NOAA's National Marine Sanctuaries before? Whew, this is the first time this has happened. 100% of the respondents have said, absolutely. That's awesome. I, it, the more high the percentage, the better. That's great. So we are going to begin our short virtual tour of the National Marine Sanctuary System. We're going to start in the most northwest corner of the continental United States, in Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary, where they protect ecosystems like tide pools. Going south into Northern California and where we're going to learn a ton more about today, Greater Fairlands National Marine Sanctuary. The sanctuary that borders Greater Fairlands is Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuary, also in Northern California, also where Jenny is representing today, and we will learn a ton more about Cordell Bank as well. Moving further south, we have Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary in California, also Northern California, touching Cordell Bank as well. We also did an expedition here in 2019 that was reviewed with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. So if you're interested in learning more about the expeditions that happen in National Marine Sanctuaries, you can find the recording of that live event in the link that we'll share at the end of this live event. Further south in California is Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary, about 25 miles off the coast of Santa Barbara, California, where there's really lush kelp forests that protect, protect an abundance of life. Going out west into the Pacific, we have Papahanao Mokuakea Marine National Monument, which is the largest marine conservation area in the world. We have Hawaiian Islands Humpback Whale National Marine Sanctuary, which protects the marine mammal humpback whale and their breeding grounds. Even further west in the National Marine Sanctuary of American Samoa, we protect one of the largest known living coral heads called Big Mama, very unique National Marine Sanctuary. Coming back to continental US, 100 miles offshore from Galveston, Texas, we have Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary, where if you're lucky, you'll see a manta. Coming closer to the Atlantic, the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, where we protect the Florida Keys Reef Track from south of Miami all the way down to Dry Tortugas. Coming a bit north to Georgia, we have Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary, which protects a live bottom reef ecosystem. And here we have our very first National Marine Sanctuary ever designated, Monitor National Marine Sanctuary, which protects one of the arguably most famous shipwrecks in the United States, the USS Monitor. And switching to our newest National Marine Sanctuary, which was designated in November of 2019, so just last year, we have Mallows Bay Potomac River National Marine Sanctuary. Now this sanctuary, as you can see from this photo, is quite unique. One, it's located in a river, and two, the shipwrecks that this sanctuary protects are partially submerged, so you can see them from above the water. Going further north into Massachusetts Bay, we have Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary, which is known for some of the best whale watching in the world. And going into the Great Lakes, we have Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary, which protects over 200 shipwrecks. We've also done two live events with staff at Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary to further understand the sanctuary itself and to go over the exploration that's happening there. So if you're interested in that, you can also check out the recordings. And we have our next Slido question. So we just concluded our virtual tour, but now that you know where they are, have you ever visited a National Marine Sanctuary before? And if you are looking for the Slido link, it is dropped in the chat. That's right. Uh, before I announce the results of the come in so far, I want to remind people as well, they can use the Slido room to send in some questions or upvote other people's questions. Of course, I'll watch the question bar as well. But 76% have been lucky enough to visit a National Marine Sanctuary. That's great. That's great to hear. And 
I want you all to know a little bit more about what the National Marine Sanctuary System does. So we protect things like the humpback whales in Monterey Bay, the sea giants, to the small sea life, like the reef fish and corals that live in many of the National Marine Sanctuaries. We are protecting places with abundant biodiversity and places that offer shelter for some of the most charismatic marine species, like the endangered Hawaiian monk seal and green sea turtle. We also are a place that protects maritime heritage, like the USS Monitor, the shipwrecks in Thunder Bay, and the shipwrecks in the newest National Marine Sanctuary, Mallows Bay, Potomac River. We are mandated through the National Marine Sanctuaries Act to conduct resource protection to save these places for generations to come. Also included in the act is mandate to do education and outreach like what we're doing today. So these are our special marine places. These are our places to paddle, our places to fish, to snorkel, to boat, to surf. These are our places to recreate in. Ooh, and here's the trick question in my part of the presentation. I've only mentioned it once at the very beginning, but how many square miles do National Marine Sanctuaries encompass? And again, the Slido link is dropped in the chat, so you can answer the question by clicking that link and answering on Slido. Okay, no fooling this crew. 69% went with 600,000 square miles. That is correct. 600,000 square miles of marine waters are protected within the National Marine Sanctuary System. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Jenny Stock, the Education and Outreach Coordinator with Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuary, to lead us on an expedition through Cordell Bank and Greater Fairlands National Marine Sanctuaries. This expedition happened in 2019 with Ocean Exploration Trust. And it, the money that they got to receive the award for this exploration was given down by NOAA to conduct telepresence exploration, which means ship to shore technology. That means that the work that happened in both of these sanctuaries was streamed live in real time to scientists and viewers across the country to participate in. Very exciting expedition, and I'm really excited to turn it over to Jenny to learn more. All right, I'm gonna give Jenny the controls. All right, can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. All right, that sounds good. Well, hi everybody. Good morning from California. And it's so fun to be here. And I love looking at all those pictures of the ocean. I've been really missing the ocean while we've been sheltering in place and staying safe. And I'm really happy to kind of dive into the ocean today with all of you and rekindle some really great memories that we made last year exploring in these really amazing places off the coast here of California. So we're gonna dive right in and tell you a little bit more about what I do. So I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator for the National Marine Sanctuary. And I had the great opportunity to work alongside scientists with our sanctuaries, our research coordinators and many other scientists to be an educator on this research expedition um, out on the exploration vessel Nautilus. And this is such a rare opportunity to actually teach about the sanctuary while in our National Marine Sanctuaries. Uh, as you'll see in a little bit, Cordell Bank is totally offshore of the coast, so a hard place to really reach people about. So it's really neat to be offshore and do this. And um, I led presentations from the ship, and I also was part of the science team, and we were talking about a lot of the things we were seeing with a live audience as this, uh, this expedition is streamed live on the web for people to see all around the world. So a really wonderful technology opportunity and great to share some of the, the highlights with you guys today. So just to give you a little bit of background where we are, so Cordell Bank and Greater Farallons actually, and the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary just to the south of us, these three contiguous National Marine Sanctuaries are just outside San Francisco in California. Monterey Bay starts in Marin County and goes all the way down to Cambria, down in Central California. The Greater Farallon Sanctuaries in Marin and goes around the Farallon Islands here. 
and the up all the way up to Point Arena. Here are the Farallon Islands, and then comes around the coast up here to Point Arena. And then Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuary is entirely offshore. Each of these places were designated at different times with communities that were really interested in seeing the special resources that are in these areas protected. And so we have all joined up in a big puzzle here. We work together quite a bit to carry out our mission of management and protection of these really special places. So it's really fun to be part of this together with them. Now, when we think about the ocean, and a lot of us, if we go to the coast or we go to the ocean, and we think about it, this is mainly what we see. Of course, we'll see some seabirds and dolphins and whales swimming by, but there is a lot of stuff going on below the surface of the water. And in our mandate to help protect these places, we need to know, well, what are we protecting down there? And so a large part of why we do this work is to learn about what's down there so we can best take care of it in the future. So for this expedition, um, it was just an incredible privilege to work with the Ocean Exploration Trust. We work with a lot of different partners over the years, some of them within NOAA, some of them outside of NOAA. The Ocean Exploration Trust has a mission to do uh, ocean research, ocean exploration all around the world. And to work with this team is just incredible because they're highly skilled and bring a ton of talent and partnership to carrying out a really great expedition. We talk about the EV Nautilus, that means Exploration Vessel Nautilus, which is a 210 foot ship that's operated by the Ocean Exploration Trust. And they have 17 permanent crew on the ship and they can have up to 31 people on the boat, which are primarily scientists, engineers, communicators, um, everybody running the science part of a mission. And the main feature of this ship is the opportunity to operate this tandem ROV system. An ROV is a remotely operated vehicle. It's a robot under the water that we control from the ship. And it can send signals up to the, um, up to the van, up where we're up on top of the ship, a video and record, and we can see what's going on thousands of feet below the ocean with this system. One thing that's just neat to highlight about why do we send two ROVs in the water well, this yellow one here, Hercules, as it's called, is the main power vehicle that shows the lights and has the cameras and has the manipulator arms to do the work right on the habitat that we wanna see. And you'll see this yellow tether here that is, comes all the way up to here. This is the Argus ROV. And Argus is kind of the stabilizer ROV. We're connected to a ship, thousand, couple thousand feet above the surface of the water and the surface of the ocean is moving, there's wind, there's currents. And so all together, these, the ship and the ROVs have to work together to maintain position so that Hercules down here can be super steady and not be yanked around by the boat and the currents. And so Argus really is a mediator um, when it comes to doing work on the ocean. Um, there are cameras on Argus too, so we can see things there. So that's just a neat part of the technology with the Ocean Exploration Trust and the Nautilus is this tandem ROV system. So we're gonna do a quick poll here that I'd like Joe to launch. All right, so the poll is launched. Those who have been in the slider room already, if you hop back in, you'll see there's some new questions that you can start to answer. Um, so I'm just gonna give a couple seconds for people to jump back into the slider room. Uh, and take a look at the new poll, the new series of questions that have opened. But so uh, if you wanna go is, ahead, yeah. Yeah, so this question is, how deep is the deep ocean? And just to get an idea of the ocean is the surface that goes down to the seafloor, and what is deep? Because there are different levels of depth on the ocean. So I wanna hear from you guys what you think are the depths of the ocean. All right, so the votes are ticking in. Let's take a quick look and see what's coming in so far. Most of them, of the results coming in so far, 78% say greater than 2,000 meters. Great. Well, there's actually two answers to this. It's a trick question. Um, so greater than 200 meters is considered deep ocean by biologists because a lot of the sunlight disappears around that depth. And so there's a ton of life that starts there. And so biologists kind of consider that the deep ocean. But physical oceanographers, people that study the physical properties of the ocean and the water, they consider deeper than 2000 meters, the deep ocean. So we are biological oceanographers for the purpose of our expedition. So pretty much anything below 200 meters, we're considering deep ocean. 
but it's just a fun little way to think about um, how we label the ocean and the different depths of the of the deep. And that was just one question, right? I can go on because I the other one's for later. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So how deep? So hopefully some of you got those answers right between 200 meters and 2000 meters. And on our expedition, we certainly spent a lot of time between those two depths. So deep sea communities along our west coast and actually all around the world provide a lot of habitat for fish and invertebrates. And deep sea coral communities, they are all around the world and these greater depths. And Sometimes we think about the tropics of the world as not having deep sea corals, but you know, you go deep under the water and it gets cold and dark. So there are deep sea corals down there as well. And they're a little known habitat. A lot of us just don't think about coral habitats in deep cold water. So I wanna tell you, just show you a couple things about them because we learned a lot about these here in our cold water. So a lot of us think about coral as being beautiful, tropical, warm water places to go snorkeling and diving. And it's true, we do have coral reefs like that. They get their energy primarily from a, a symbiotic zooanthellae. It's a type of algae that lives inside the coral and the algae gets energy from the sun and provides energy to the coral and in return, the coral provides a place for that zooanthellae to live. And so that's how corals get their energy primarily and some of them feed from plankton too. But in the deep sea, it's very different. There is no sunlight. So they don't have that symbiotic algae living in their tissues. They completely rely on what is raining down from the seafloor above to the depths. So we call that marine snow or detritus. And what that stuff is, is pretty much anything that lives on the surface eventually is going to die and decay and just rain down to the seafloor. And that becomes the food for these corals and sponges. I have a, a little video here to show you what marine snow looks like when you're down at depth. It's kind of a nice snowstorm of detritus going down to the seafloor, and that's great food for all those animals down there. So a little bit more about corals. They are all around the world with temperatures down to minus one degree Celsius or 30 degrees Fahrenheit. We know there are more than 3,000 species of deep sea corals and through expeditions like these, new ones are discovered every year. And some can be extremely long lived. One colony of a deep black coral was found to be more than 4,000 years old. These are very slow growing organisms in an environment that doesn't really change too much or change too quickly at those depths. So really interesting to learn more about. So this next question is about how do we know where to target areas for exploration? So let's go for our next poll. Joe, you there? I'm here, yeah. I don't, let's see. What <clears throat> is that question, Jenny? I don't know if I got that one in the initial post. Uh, do deep sea corals and sponges attach to soft or hard habitat? I do have that question. Yes, that is the question that is up right now. Let's see what people are saying. Bring up my results. All right, 74% say it is hard habitat. Good job, you guys. You are absolutely right. We want to go to areas in the ocean that have hard habitat. But when back to that picture of the big ocean, how do we know where that hard habitat is? With all that water on top of the ocean, it's pretty hard to figure out where is the hard habitat. And so we have to figure out how, to, how do we know where to go? And thankfully we have technology that has really helped us learn about the surface of, I'm gonna say the surface of the earth because the ocean is on top of the earth, but it's covered up with water. And we have seafloor mapping that really helps us to determine where these places are. We get contours of the seafloor, how deep it is. There's canyons and banks and, and rifts and, and all sorts of interesting features all along the seafloor that can tell us where we might wanna go. There's also some higher resolution technologies that find tell us how deep they are, how steep they are, meaning a slope. Also where there might be areas that have hard substrate as we call it, or anything hard for something to hold on to. Corals and sponges need to attach to something hard, and so we wanna to go to those areas. So we work with scientists with USGS that help us determine where to go, and that's a really integral part of planning an expedition. 
And then when we actually get out there, the vehicle itself, this is Hercules that is getting us down to the seafloor and will be bringing us the imagery. And so I have a little video to show you what that looks like. And if you notice, there's a team of people on the deck there. I'm really awe, in awe of this beautiful day on the ocean because normally when I'm out there, it's blowing and there's giant swells. And this is like a perfect day out at sea in our sanctuaries because this is kind of a windy area. But there's a team of people working to launch this ROV. <clears throat> you can see some of the instruments below on the side. We have bio boxes and water catchment. This big yellow piece here, it's called syntactic foam. And that is specially designed to have the right buoyancy at depth so that the ROV doesn't bounce around up and down and keeps the right buoyancy um, underwater. So it takes a big team of people working together. They're all communicating about what to do, how to do it. And this is, a, I would say, a fairly easy launch based on the weather conditions. But I remember one expedition I was on in 2017, we had a really hairy return because the swell and the wind picked up and it was really tense um, getting the vehicle back up on board safely. So that's kind of a fun part is getting excited about those cameras getting in the water and going down to see what's down under the water. So, oops, that's not the, that's the wrong thing. Okay. So here's just a picture underneath. It's not, this is not the right heading there in the van, but underneath here, this is, you can see cameras and you can see the lights and some, this is the bio box and the deck. There's a little thing here called the slurp. So we can slurp up soft things. And then here's a close up of a box where we can put specimens that we want to sample. A lot of these corals in the deep, we can look at and think, oh, I think it's this, but it takes experts to really determine what those are. And so we do collect some specimens that we're like, oh, we're not really sure what that is. We work with Gary Williams at the California Academy of Sciences who helps us identify these corals and he's part of this cruise as well. So here's the van. So that the ROV is underwater and you have that fiber optic cable that feeds a live video stream up to the van and in the van, we have the pilots and the navigator and scientists and the data logger and the communicators all working together to run this mission. You can see these two heads here. This is the navigator who is basically maintaining position of the ROVs with the ship. So there's constant little corrections going on. This is the ROV pilot, one of the ROV pilots, the Hercules, and then the Argus pilot is here. And then these two screens back here where the scientists are. And we have quite a view of what's going on. You really feel like you're almost snorkeling because these screens are so big. So after a dive, which can be 20, 24 hours, a very long dive, we have shifts. Everybody works in four hour shifts and we take turns and pass information off to the next shift. When the dive is done, we have these specimens to process. And so here are some of the specimens we've collected and in the lab, processing them properly and labeling them. And many of these are then shipped off to institutions where experts are. And there's sponge experts. There's people that can tell the different types of sponges by studying them under the microscope. Um, sponge is always tricky to handle. You can see these cool spicules sticking out. They're really, really sharp. And you really wanna be careful with sponge because it is a very tricky specimen. You don't wanna get under your skin and your itches and hurts. Um, but our experts can put these under the microscope and look at the finer details to determine the species of these animals, which is really important. So for our expedition, uh, we worked with Cordell and Farallons together. They're right next to each other. And so working together, we can be a lot more efficient. And the main goal was to continually to explore areas that we have not seen and to assess areas that are being considered for fisheries management changes. And so really getting to know what these habitats look like, um, it's basically looking like a needle in the haystack with a, with a flashlight underwater. And so we're just still getting to know the habitats that we have. So when we talk about exploring, we are looking at habitats, looking at species not seen before, but also identifying them if we can, collecting samples of them to properly identify, um, also collecting sediment and water samples to learn about the water chemistry at depth and also to learn about what microfossils might be in the sediment that can tell us about past um, conditions in the ocean. So there's a lot of data that we can get when we go down below. We try to get as much as we can, and we work with scientists ashore to do that, to take the most advantage of spending that time underwater to learn as much as we can. So I wanna share some highlights with you of what we saw. 
I'm going to start with the Greater Farallon National Marine Sanctuary, and we were up in this northern area. And if you look on this map here, you'll see there's like a light blue area, and then it gets deep dark blue. And so this light blue area is called the Continental Shelf. And then right on the edge, it slopes down into deep, deep water. And we spent some time in some deep water of the Farallons at about 5,900 feet, but we came up to shallower water as well. Still considered deep sea, um, greater than 500 feet, and that really, really interesting habitat of incredible cool rocky features, which I'm gonna show you some of the fun um, things that we saw. So we did two dives up there. Um, one was 20 hours and one was 22 hours, and it was super fun to see some great stuff. So this is something we've seen a couple times up in the region of the Farallons, our cat shark egg cases. And that you can see that egg case is uh, developing a little shark inside there, and there's some other animals there, sea stars and fish. Here's a whole bunch more egg cases, cat shark egg cases. You can also see the rock is just covered with sponge and other neat little hydroids and brachiopods. Pretty much every square inch gets covered with life when you have rock under the ocean. So here's what a cat shark looks like. They're not the hugest shark, but they are one of the sharks that enjoy the deep sea. And this shark is on the seafloor. You'll see a bunch of pink urchins with it on the seafloor too. And there's a little gelatinous tinafore floating by. They're just real cute. Kind of shy, not that active. Probably a little surprised to see an ROV in the water. <laughs> <clears throat> so now this one, before I start the video, take a quick look and see if you can see anything. This is the great disguise, uh, the great disguiser or costumed organism in the ocean. And this is the decorator crab. It was vicious. And the decorator crab basically attaches all these different um, so this is an or animals to it. Hold on one second. An yeah. anemone, not a crab. It's a crab eating an anemone. Oh, I see. So the crab attaches all the stuff onto its exoskeleton to hide so it can't be seen by other animals like maybe giant Pacific Any octopus. Any species? But you can see anemones sticking out <laughs> on it. <laughs> Back row is like it's shaking ripping it apart. Out. This is, we're in shallow water, yeah. relatively speaking. I'm, uh, I'm not <laughs> good like at that. just tearing off chunks. I think because uh, the smooth part is too hard to just bite on too smooth to get a get a piece of oh thought he ripped it or she take it apart from the inside all right let's come forward. go ahead there you can see it in context of that rock so it's so fun when we can zoom in like that to see a uh, close up of animals and what they're doing in their habitat. And that crab was having a little snack on an anemone. And it's just so cool to see the different animals living on top of it. And I think that will be a really good Halloween costume one year for me. Uh, we saw flapjack octopus. These guys are super cute <clears throat> and they can flatten themselves out like a pancake. Octopus are amazing in the different types of shapes and colors they can get themselves into. And flapjacks can get really, really flat. But here's just, and there's a little rockfish with it next to it. <clears throat> That's a short little video. And in shallower water, so we were in, you know, about 500 feet of water, which is where we might see giant Pacific octopus. And we saw some beautiful adult octopus that are really cool to watch as they move along. You'll see a sea cucumber here, sea stars, brachiopods, which are type of mollusk, like a clam. It's like there's a fish ha hanging out in there. And now this is another close-up of a crab, but it's gonna zoom out. And what's really cool to watch here is the krill. So krill are a type of euphousid, a type of little shrimp that are a huge part of the food web here on the West Coast. They're food for whales and seabirds and fish. And we saw super dense krill while we were in this region in the Farallons. It was almost like you couldn't even see the habitat. I'm gonna run that a couple times because it goes pretty quick. But these krill um, are really nutritious for whales 
and some seabirds, but we saw some fish eating them and we saw some other animals eating them too. These are canary rockfish and lingcod. And I'm gonna see if you can see here, this is a close up of what krill looks like. This is from a collection um, of the krill and those little black eyes are how they see because they live in dark environments. So that helps them to collect as much light as possible. So that was really a cool thing to see, to see that incredible, what we call productivity. It's food for so many animals and seeing it so dense was really exciting. Now, this was one of the super cool findings that we didn't really know about before, but this is a type of, of a sunflower star called a raffinaster. And they are pretty voracious predators living on the deeper parts of the ocean. But we saw this sea star eating krill, which is pretty cool because krill swims around and the sea stars live on the seafloor. But take a look and watch their sticky tentacles. Yeah, their little krill feet. stuck all throughout Oh, that's that. awesome. So it's actually catching them. Wow, so we have this Pycnopodia catching krill, actively catching krill. You can <laughs> see the tentacles going mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. How cool. Yeah, and then we'll just slowly pass it down to the mouth. I don't think I've ever seen this before. <laughs> I have not. <laughs> With that. There's krill stuck all over these tube feet. JB, have you seen this before? No, I think it's very cool. Everybody's been wanting to see a predation event. Yeah. Got go. it, Kelly. <laughs> I thought we had a predation event when that lingcod sat on that yeah. rockfish. How's the ship move doing? It's not doing anything. Oh, okay. It just has a, a different screen, yeah. Oh, it's like a feast. Yeah, go ahead. You can really see how dense it is. Huh. Go Sea Star, having a blast. So that was one of the cool findings that we saw. No one had seen that before on the ship. And um, actually a scientist uh, from the Smithsonian uh, echinoderm specialist was tweeting about how cool that was to see. And that was fun to, yeah, to see. So in the Farallons area, we saw amazing diversity in the rocky areas and also down to some depth. Um, this is a, a basket or a type of coral that is shaped like a basket and you can kind of see how maybe it's shaped that way to catch that detritus that rains down but you also really clearly see how it's habitat for a lot of other animals these are brittle stars this is a crinoid there's a basket star stuck over here and each of these little dots here those are all little tentacles for catching the um detritus that rains down and then this giant sponge also shaped almost like a funnel to catch the food with a, a great habitat for a rockfish to hang out in. So you can really see how sponge and, and, and coral communities really provide space for a lot of different animals. So hopping over to Cordell Bank, uh, showing you where we dove over here. We did two dives, one in Box Canyon and one in Bodega Canyon. And these are areas to the, that were added to the sanctuary when we expanded in 2015. And so it was really truly exploration, like what's down there? What are we protecting? We, we went in 2017 for the first time and this cruise helped build on what we were seeing in 2017. Um, Bodega Canyon dive was the deepest dive we've ever done at the sanctuary to just the edge of the sanctuary almost at 10,885 feet. That's over two miles under the ocean. So that was really exciting. And if you can think about how long it takes to, to descend an ROV, it took about two to three hours to get the ROV just down to the seafloor there um, in terms of time spent. So there's a lot of sitting around on a boat waiting um, when we're doing exploration. So let's take a look at some of the highlights that we saw. We saw a lot of invertebrates, and I should say a lot of these things that we saw in Cordell, we've seen in Farallons too, and other deep uh, water dives that we've done in the Farallons region. 
a lot of different types of invertebrates. This is a type of snail and an egg tower where it builds this cool tower to lay its eggs. Uh, sea spider, which is a, it's called a picnogonid and they can get really big and it's, it's a type of crab that's on the seafloor. Stocked crinoid and another animal that can catch detritus from the seafloor. This beautiful solitary crino, um, hydroid and more lots of sponge and funky cool shapes of sponge. This is one we don't know the name of yet. We of course saw octopus, some of our predators. Uh, the Grenaladone Boreo Pacifica octopus, which we know in Monterey, um, the cruise that was after ours is an amazing breeding spot with awesome cool habitat where Grenaladones um, breed. And I'm, some of the questions I have is, wow, so there's a hot spot in Monterey where they breed. I wonder if those octopus come up to our area or do we have breeding spots? There's so many questions that seeing these animals brings. Um, and then the flapjack octopus again, of course, moving through the water, really cute. Saw so sea cucumbers, and these are the cleaner uppers, vacuum cleaners of the seafloor. These animals are filtering the, the sediment on the seafloor. They have one hole on their body, and that's not the best strategy, in my opinion, because they eat out of the same hole that they excrete out of. So not something you wanna do for a Halloween costume. These cucumbers are really good at, at sifting the sediment and just sucking it in and, and filtering it. And they have really cool little uh, uh, tentacles for helping to cement, move themselves along on the seafloor. We saw lots of different types of anemones. The pom-pom anemone, which kind of looks like a pom-pom and a burrowing anemone that kind of burrows into the soft, soft sediment. And of course, we saw lots of different types of corals like we've seen in Farallons. And in 2017, the first time we went, we saw over 42 new species that we hadn't seen before of corals and sponges. And it was just phenomenal to realize we have all these amazing animals down at the depth there that we are in charge of protecting as a National Marine Sanctuary. These bamboo corals are incredible and really important for studying. We work with scientists at Bodega Marine Lab to learn more about them and um, and dating them and, and learning about past ocean conditions by studying them. Um, this is a cup coral, a lot smaller, and a close up of a mushroom coral, which, if you just look, is just absolutely beautiful to see their tentacles and how they really maximize their body shape for catching food from above. This was one of the really cool findings, and it doesn't seem super cool as a coral, but they are really cool to us. Um, these tube worms, and we saw this in Box Canyon. And tube worms are usually an animal that hang out around hydrogen sulfide or um, spreading centers on the seafloor. And we don't have a spreading center here, but it brought a lot of questions about, hmm, what is this rock all about? Because this type of animal basically gets its energy from the rocks and whatever the rock is seeping out. So a really interesting animal to find. And it was really quite a surprise to discover these things. And we'll be learning a lot more as we go forward to learn more about, well, what's this rock seeping out? We're not entirely sure. So tube worms were a, a, certainly a very cool highlight. Something else we've seen is that um, from 2017, we saw some of the species that were positively identified that we saw in our expedition that these were species that were seen outside their previously known depth ranges as well as geographic ranges. And we found them in deeper depths or further away from where we knew they were before um, in our, our National Marine Sanctuary. And so that's what exploration can do is help us learn more about where these organisms exist around the world. We also found a new species uh, in 2017, we just found out that this sponge is actually a new species and it was named after the sanctuary, Ferrea cordelli. Um, so another great finding. And who knows what these organisms hold in terms of benefits for other animals, but also for humans. There has been some research on sponges and corals about some of the properties of them that might be beneficial for humans. We also saw some, in, some vertebrates down below. We saw different types of fishes that always are really cool looking with their big eyes or different body shape. Um, my, some of my favorite are the grenadier. And actually, I'm gonna show you a video here that Hannah's gonna launch so you can see some of these things moving really quickly.
so this skate is most likely a rough tail skate and it's most likely a male based on the long claspers. What's the parasite, the little like worm in the back? A little tag on the back, yeah. yeah. Like a beautiful, massive coral. Beautiful. Wow. Ah, look at you guys. That's great. <laughs> I wonder what they're communicating. All right. <laughs> All right, video, go ahead and come wide, please. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, it's gorgeous collection. Really close. And crinoids next to it, too. Yeah. <laughs> Las, Las Vegas. Vegas. And the oh, colors, cool. that is beautiful. Wow. Awesome, wow. Aaron. So the little red dots are little sclerites? Thank you for showing that video, Hannah. So the, though the video, you can hear people talking and all the video from all the dives are available on YouTube. I will put the link up um, when we get to the questions so people can go and watch these entire dives on your own. It's really fun to watch them in the background if you're doing something else. So that was just some of the highlights of Cordell. So, this so what's the significance of all this? For us, in order to best protect our national marine sanctuaries, we have to know what is there. And so this exploration of learning about the, the animals that are there, what the habitat looks like, what the conditions are is really important as we go forward in helping to best protect these places. And working with the Ocean Exploration Trust, we really can help increase appreciation for this special place by the communication that we're able to do from the ship and by sharing it with you today. So some of the threats to deep sea communities are, are very real. And we did see some impacts while we were down there, specifically marine debris. Um, these are some of the things that are of concern for deep sea communities around the world, certainly ocean conditions that are changing, um, harmful fishing gear that can really destroy these habitats, oil spills and anything that sinks down to the bottom from treating oil spills, or fishing gear that might get lost out at sea and, and sit down on the seafloor and kind of trap things, as well as the marine debris. Um, ocean acidification, which is the chemistry of the ocean that's getting more acidic, is could be a threat to species down at depth, but primarily to species at the surface. But remember, everything down in the deep is relying on everything up at the surface. So if there are things happening at the surface waters, it's going to affect the deep sea at some point, as well as warming of the ocean. So these are all real big concerns we have, not just for the surface of the ocean, but for the deep as well. These are pictures of marine debris that we saw in our national marine sanctuaries that are becoming habitat for other animals in a funny way. This plastic bag, I think, is really interesting. Um, but we do have marine debris out there, and thankfully, it does become habitat for some point, but it's not something we want to see, and some marine debris could actually prevent other species from growing. So we really want to protect people and places from being harmed by the issues facing our environment, and that's a big part of what we're doing by engaging with our communities, um, engaging with you to help take steps to help protect the ocean. And one of the things I wanna end with is hearing from you with our last Slido poll that what are the things that you wanna see um, or you can take action on that we can all take action on to best help protect the deep sea? All right, so I've had that one open for a little while. Let's see what has come in so far. Oof, lots. So, um, slow down global warming, deny mining to the ocean floor for minerals, stop illegal dumping, reduce our carbon footprint through recycling and clean water acts. Um, let's see, what else? Divest in fossil fuels, more stop use of single use plastic and recycling, lots of use less plastics, limit bottom trawling. Uh, more native species being planted on land, reducing emissions, a few more for regulating seafloor trawling and using sustainable seafood. Ooh, lots more research, that's an important one. Uh, and then reef-friendly sunscreen, avoid disposable plastics. So lots of good answers coming in. Excellent, so everybody's on the right track. Those are all things that really matter. Everything we do on land affects the ocean. 
So if you think about everything, activities you do every day, if it's even just turning the lights off when you're not using them and saving energy, we all can take these steps to help, help with solutions for the ocean. Thank you for sharing your ideas. So lastly, just wanted to thank the other collaborators that were a big part of this mission, working with the Ocean Exploration Trust, Trust the USGS, the Greater Farallons Association, and the California Academy of Sciences. All of these organizations working together, we are able to do so much more work together. And this doesn't even feature all the scientists from all around the world that contribute by being part of this mission with either helping collect data or helping us to target specific areas for data. So I just wanna say thank you to all of them. And this would be a great time to do some questions. All right, Jenny, that sounds like a plan to me. Thank you for an awesome presentation. I especially loved all the deep sea uh, video. Reminds me of my time on board the Nautilus, which was a lot of fun, just next door in the Monterey Bay uh, National Marine Sanctuary. So those who have questions, if you wanna send them in via the Slido room, if you wanna send them in directly via um, the, the question so, slot, we're yeah. ready for them. All right, so first question here. In Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuary, um, seeing as it's a little bit further from shore, how shallow does it get and is there opportunities for recreational and technical scuba divers? Great question. So actually I'll um, go back to a slide so that I can talk about that a little bit easier. And so Cordell Bank, it starts about six miles off the shore here of Point Reyes and Bodega Bay, goes out about 30 miles. And the main feature is this Cordell Bank itself. And we've done ROV cruises out there to really look at the amazing habitat of this shallow bank, a couple hundred feet deep. And it's dense and colorful and beautiful with so much other life. Um, and in terms of uh, we do research out there, but it is, and it, there's nothing that we regulate that people can't, but it is a very challenging environment to do any type of recreational scuba diving. And we don't want to discourage it, but we do want people to know how, how dangerous it is. There's a shipping lane that comes out of San Francisco that goes through here. And so there's ships that go through. The conditions can change really quickly with big swell and big wind. So it does take a lot of planning. Um, there have been some people that have done a lot of work and a lot of preparation that have been able to dive at Cordell, um, but they take a lot of time to prepare and they consult with the sanctuary. And they've actually worked with us to uh, get permits to help carry out some research missions as well. So there is there's a little bit, but it's a really challenging place. I kind of think Cordell Bank is one of those National Marine Sanctuaries that is by default um, a sanctuary that's really hard for people to get to and to disturb. So it, it really is an amazing biodiverse hotspot. All right. So Craig sent in a question and Craig's curious about the marine snow in the video. Was that sped up at all or is that a good uh, depiction of the rate it falls? That was not sped up. Um, that was actually taken years ago in a submersible. We used to dive in a submersible in shallow parts around the bank. And so it was kind of pixelated. But no, that's actually about the rate and it changes, but you, that's about how it is, just starts raining down and it picks up speed as the as it goes deeper because of the pressure. Okay, question just came into the Slido room and they were wondering how much preparation uh, does it take before going out on an expedition like the one you did with Nautilus? Well, our research scientists, our research coordinators spend over a year planning, but it's actually years by the f sense that there's constantly um, work d being done to better understand, well, what do we have data on? What do we need data on? What do we have mapping data on? How do we get mapping data? And constantly working with collaborators and funders to try to find funding to support these missions. So it's actually years of work that accumulate in having to do this cruise. And once that funding is determined, it takes at least a year to plan this mission. And that's working with the team, uh, working with the, the map data, working with our collaborators on, on species we might be looking for and creating plans. So it's quite a bit of work. And that's why every single minute counts out there to do the most that we can to make it count. So 
Jan Roletto is a research coordinator at Fairlawns and Danny Litsky at Cordell Bank. And I know they work a lot, very hard, a lot of phone calls to prepare for carrying out these missions. Susan, Susan would like to know, I think you mentioned that some of those corals were 4,000 years old. How do you determine the age of the coral? So that was black coral. And um, I'm not, I'm not a, a coral specialist, but I know that they can basically date some of the corals based on calcium carbonate that they have in their skeletons. And they can um, basically look at the different layers of that under the microscope and also do um, prototype. I'm not sure, I can't remember the right word, but they can analyze those calcium carbonate layers to find out how old they are. So that's pretty amazing. That's probably the oldest that we know of. And these are very slow growing. Remember the conditions down there are pretty harsh. It's cold, it's deep. They completely rely on what rains down from above. So there might be good food years. There might be food years that are not so good. So they don't, may not grow so fast, um, but it all happens in a lab with that, that dating, carbon dating. Okay, um, let's see. So a question about the ROV is that you, you might know the answer to this, Jenny. This is from someone who's nine, but I do want to clarify because a few questions have come in about the ROVs, like um, how long, how can you stay down so long uh, without going to the washroom for 20, 24 minutes? So I just do want to stress that the ROVs are operated from above uh, on the ship. So nobody goes down uh, in those remotely operated vehicles. But the question we have about the ROVs is, do you know about some of the features or technology that allow them to survive really deep? Yeah, a little bit here I can share is, um, first of all, they are designed to be at depth. And no, there is no humans on board these vehicles. They're all operated from the ship and they're amazing robots. And so it does take a lot of marine engineering to design every little speck of this instrument to be able to go to such great depths. Um, I talked about this foam here. This is called syntactic foam, which are thousands of little glass beads that are um, encapsulated in epoxy. And it creates the type of buoyancy that the ROV will be able to stay steady and just a little positive, meaning it's not gonna go thump on the seafloor. And so it, it's designed to do that at depth. Um, all of the other instruments have, if there is um, any mechanisms for releasing things, they have oil embedded in the tubes because oil won't expand like air will. So water has air bubbles in it and that'll expand or compress at depth, but oil will not. So a lot of instruments have oil in them to maintain uh, the hydraulics inside. Um, so there's a lot of maintenance of those little pieces. Uh, certain types of, I'm not sure what the, I think it's titanium perhaps on some of the other vehicle pieces that are metal to be able to withstand those depths. Um, the tether itself, I actually have a piece of tether here and I'm gonna see if I can just go a little bigger here to show you. Can you guys see this okay? So this is a piece of tether. So in 2017, our tether got nicked and they had to redo the whole tether on the ship. But this one you can see how thickly it's how thick it is wrapped and the fiber optic cable is in the middle there and that's to withstand the pressure and the salt um, going to depth so there's a lot of different types of cool technology to be able to go down deep with these machines and there are universities that specialize in marine electronics and marine technology for um, learning about the ocean at depth so i highly recommend checking them out all right, good, great question here about from Craig. And Craig is wondering about the name Cordell Bank. What does a bank mean in the ocean? Oh yeah, so a bank is a, a feature on the seafloor that is continental in origin, meaning it started as part of the, um, the mass of land. And as plate tectonics took place and things got shifted around and moved around, they got submerged underwater eventually. And so Cordell Bank was originally part of the Southern Sierra Nevada mountains. And then as it moved, nor shifted north, it became underwater as sea level rose thousands of years ago. And so there's other features on the seafloor too that came as part of that um, landmass. 
And so it's continental in origin, whereas a seamount grows up from the seafloor as an ancient, as a volcano and becomes an ancient volcano and is a seamount. So a little bit different there. All right, very cool. Well, I want to start off on my end by giving a huge shout out to everybody who tuned in live today. Thank you for the great questions in the Slido as well as in the question bar. Uh, thanks for playing along with the Slido polls. That's always fun. Uh, Jenny, obviously a huge thank you to you, but I want to turn things over to Hannah now and let her wrap things up for today. Awesome. Thank you, Joe. And thank you so much, Jenny, for sharing such great information. And those visuals of the in those videos were incredible. So thank you for really taking us under into Cordell Bank and Greater Fairlands National Marine yeah. Sanctuary. Thank you. Today's, yeah, you're welcome. Today's webinar, as well as a number of webinars that we've partnered with Exploring by the Sea to Your Pants with, are located on their YouTube channel. You can expect this one to be up within the next week but all of our past recordings are up live there, so check out those. They're great and often reviewing expeditions like the one with Nautilus. We have three more upcoming programs next week that are doing exploration in Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary. Now this expedition is broken up into three legs. So we did coral spawning, reef biodiversity, as well as black corals. So if you're interested in corals or interested in knowing more about Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary, these are going to be the live events for you. There's also more ways that you can connect to the ocean live. We have our live interactions for students like you're partaking in now. We have a webinar series that's tailored for educators to learn about the sanctuary system and marine resources that they can bring into their classroom. We also want to promote Exploring by the Sea to Your Pants. Joe listed a few of his upcoming programs that sound fantastic to bring explorers, scientists, and experts in all fields to you. And then NOAA Ocean Today also has live events. Their next one is on June 5th, and it will highlight shipwrecks and sanctuaries. So that's another great way to connect live to the ocean. In concluding today's webinar, you will receive a survey link. We request that any adult that has about three minutes to complete this survey fills it out. It helps us guide what types of programs we will lead into the future with different topic areas and different formats as well. So programs like the one you're seeing now were tailored from this survey, so we really, really love your input. And with that, I want to thank Joe from Exploring by the Sea to Your Pants for bringing us on to present our work. And thank Jenny so much for sharing Greater Fairlands and Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuary. And then thank all of the attendees for being so engaged and partaking in our poll questions and having so many great questions come in for Jenny as well. So thank you all. Uh, this concludes today's webinar.